Good evening, Mount Calvary and friends. Again, welcome to Wednesday in the Word. How delighted we are to have you with us tonight. We do not take your presence for granted, for we do know that you could be watching any ministry around this world at this particular time, but you are joining us. And for that, we are indeed grateful and we are indeed thankful. My brothers and sisters, let us go to the Word of God. But before we go, let us pray. Oh God, how we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you, God, for your love, your joy, your peace, your compassion, your care, your provision. We thank you, God, for the forgiveness of sins, and we thank you, God, for another chance to try and get it right. We thank, we are thankful, God, for another week, for another opportunity to study your word in this virtual setting. Oh Master, we lift in prayer those who are bereaved, sick, troubled, stressed, lonely, discouraged, depressed, and in despair. We pray, God, that you would touch their minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. We pray, God, that you would help them to have hope for a better tomorrow. We pray, God, that even now, that they would give you praise in spite of the challenges of today. Now, God, be with us in our study. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to receive, and open our hearts to believe. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, tonight we'll uh, conclude our series as uh, talking about good news about grace. Talking about good news about grace. Uh, for the last eight weeks, uh, we have been looking at the various aspects of grace. Uh, of course, the goal of this series has been for you to understand grace, experience grace, to feel grace, and to enjoy the grace of God in your life. If you remember that we began uh, this series talking about a grace that saves, uh, a sec the second week we talked about a grace that sustains, uh, the third week we talked about a grace that heals, the fourth week we talked about a grace that liberates, the fifth week we talked about a grace that will help you forgive, the sixth, weeks we, sixth week uh, we talked about a grace that restores the seventh week, we talked about a grace that transforms. The eighth week, we talked about a grace that releases guilt. And my brothers and sisters, those are not only the many expressions, but they are also the benefits of grace, the benefits of God's grace. Uh, tonight, we will uh, conclude uh, this series uh, by reminding us that uh, his grace is amazing, that his grace is amazing. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, there's nothing but God's grace. We walk upon it, we breathe it, we live it, and we die by it. Everything is by God's grace. We would not even have our own lives if it were not for God's grace. And as we conclude this series, I want to once again ask the question, how do you get God's grace? How do you get God's grace? The Bible says that you get God's grace by trusting Jesus. Yeah, you get God's grace by trusting Jesus. Three simple words, by trusting Jesus. God made it so simple that nobody could say it is, it is too hard to understand. Uh, but you get it by trusting Jesus. You don't have to go through 23 steps of faith, uh, four pathways of righteousness, eight roads to salvation, or 32 rituals of the, of the church. You get it. You get it through trusting Jesus by putting your faith in Jesus. That's the only way that you can get it is by trusting Jesus. The Bible says in uh, John 1 and 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and all that we have talked about for the last eight weeks is wrapped up in one person, and that person is Jesus. He is the source. Grace and truth comes through him. If you don't get it through him, you don't get it at all. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't get grace through religion. 
You don't get grace through rituals. You don't get grace through rules. But you get grace through a relationship, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and 11 says, Now we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends of God. Now that's what you call having friends in high places. You become a friend of God through grace. So grace is a free gift. And because it's a free gift, all you need to do is just accept the free gift. But although the grace, the grace is free, it's not cheap. Grace is not cheap because it cost Jesus his life. Jesus died on the cross to pay for grace. So in a very real sense, grace is the most expensive commodity there is. Jesus, and because it, it is, Jesus never wants us to forget what he did for us. He never wants us to forget the sacrifice that he made so that we could experience the grace of God. So he gave us a reminder because he never wants us to forget the sacrifice that he made. He gave us a reminder. He created a symbol. And today we call it Holy Communion. When we take Holy Communion, it reminds us that grace has come to us because Jesus died for our sins. It reminds us of what Jesus did so that we could have his grace. So what happened when Jesus died on the cross? What really took place when he hung there over 2,000 years ago that makes something so significant that we celebrate it and we remember it with a symbol some over 2,000 years later? When Jesus died on the cross, he did three things. One, he paid the penalty for sin. The penalty for our sins have been taken care of. It's like getting... Uh, getting a get out of jail free card from a uh, from Monopoly, uh, that is what grace is. One day you're going to stand before God, and He is going to say you blew it, you sinned. But Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sins, so you are forgiven. So He paid the penalty for sin. Two is He broke the power of sin. Not only did He pay the penalty. For sin, but he broke the power of sin. Uh, what that means is Jesus now gives us the power to change the habits, the hurts, and the hangups in our lives that messed us up. So sin no longer have power over us. We are free because uh, Jesus broke the power of sin. And three, the presence of of sin would be no more. The presence of sin would be no more. One day we're going to go to heaven and there isn't going to be sin anywhere in heaven. He has guaranteed it because of the cross. And, 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 and can I throw this in the gumbo as it relates to Holy Communion? There, there's a lot of mystery and misunderstanding about taking Holy Communion. Most of us come from many, many different backgrounds. And, and the question is, what should my attitude be when I take Holy Communion? How should I feel when I remember the death of Jesus Christ? Uh, should I feel guilty when I'm taking the Holy Communion because I'm remembering all of the sins that I have committed? No. Holy Communion is not uh, to make you feel guilty. Holy Communion says, remember Jesus has already paid for all of your wrong. So you don't have to feel guilty because of grace. Should you feel grief when taking Holy Communion? Should you feel like you are at a funeral because it's something sad and as you remember the death of Jesus Christ? No, because Jesus didn't stay dead. 
Three days later, after they had put him in the tomb, he got up out of the grave. And as the angels declared, he is risen. He is not here. So we don't serve a dead God. We don't serve a dead Savior. Therefore, there is no need to grieve. Well, since we don't have uh, grief and guilt, what should the attitude be when taking Holy Communion? Uh, you should have an attitude of gratitude. When you take those two elements that symbolizes what Jesus did for you, you should be thinking, how could God love me like this? How could God love me this much? The Bible tells us how much he loves us. 1 John 3 and 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. That is what we should be grateful for, that he died for us. So when we take those symbols of bread and juice as we remember what they symbolize, in your mind you ought to be saying, Lord, by taking this, I believe that Jesus died for me and I accept his grace. Uh, for on the night that Jesus was betrayed, took bread and broke, blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, you are familiar with the generosity of Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us in one stroke. He became poor that we might become rich. And as we take the cup and drink of it, we remember the shed blood of Jesus on Calvary. And you ought to say in your mind, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your amazing, outrageous, and inconceivable grace. So in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us, what should our response be? In light of those eight things that grace offers to us, those eight benefits of grace, and made possible because of what Jesus did on the cross, how should you respond? 2 Corinthians 6 and 1 says, So we beg you, do not let the grace you receive from God be for nothing. What do you owe Jesus Christ? You owe him the rest of your life. You owe him everything that you have. You owe him the past, the present, and the future. You owe him everything. As we conclude this series, I want to give you three ways that you can express gratitude for, for God's grace. One, you can show your gratitude for God's grace by making your life count. By making your life count. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. Don't you see that you can't keep on living however you please? Swandering what God paid such a high price for? So let people see God in and through your body. In other words, you can't understand the grace of God and just keep on living the same way as you have always lived. You can't understand the grace of God and keep on ignoring his commands. Keep wasting your time on trivial stuff. Keep spending your money any way that you want to spend it. You can't do that anymore. Because you have been bought with a price. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for you to just go on living any old way you want. He made you for a purpose. He created you for a purpose. He redeemed you for a purpose. He died for you for a purpose. And he wants you to fulfill the purpose 
that he has for your life. First Peter tells us each one of us should use whatever gifts he has that he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. The talents, abilities, opportunities, education, freedom, relationships, and all the things that you have that blesses your life were not given to be squandered. They were given for a purpose. God expects you to use those for a purpose. He has shown you his grace, so you have to make your life count and fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. Two, by becoming a generous person. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you are familiar with the generosity of Jesus. Rich as he was, he gave it all away in one stroke. He became poor, and we became rich. If you want to measure how much you understand grace, if you want to measure how much you are living by grace, if you want to measure how much you are grateful for grace, all you need to do is just look at your giving. Look at your giving. In 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9, each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God's love, for God loves a chip forgiver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in his ever good works. Look at look at all. Look at the alls in this passage. All grace, all things, all times, having all that you need. This passage is important because it tells us what Jesus is like. And what is Jesus like? Jesus is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave. And because God gave, because God the Father gave, God the Son gives. You are never going to be, you are never going to become like Jesus until you learn to be like Jesus. Yeah. You are never going to become like Jesus until you learn to be like Jesus. The Christian life is summed up in three words, love, serve, and give. Yep, yeah. love, serve, and give. Until you learn to be generous with your time, with your money, with your life, with your resources, with your opportunities, you are not going to be like Christ. And no greater proof of your understanding of grace than when you are loving, gracious, and generous to other people and God. If you are uptight when I or some other pastor start to talk about giving, if you get defensive or nervous when giving is mentioned, it simply means that you do not understand grace at all. Look at the verse again. He says, if you give cheerfully, liberally, abundantly, what is God going to do? God would take care of all of your needs, all of the, the time, in every way. So here's the question. Are you going to trust the Lord who gave his life for you? Are you going to trust him? If you can trust him enough for salvation, can't you trust 
him enough in your finances? The truth is you really don't own anything. God has loaned everything that you have. God has loaned it to you for 60, 70, 80, 90, at best 120 years. Because it belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. God gives to us in a generous way, in a very abundant, abundant way. And he only asks for us to show some gratitude for his generosity, for how he abundantly blesses us. And he wants us to be generous in our giving, the tithe, giving back to God. Why? Because God needs the money? No. Because God wants you to become more like him. God doesn't want you to have a stingy heart, but God wants you to have a Jesus heart. A heart that says, I can't wait to give in every area. The Bible says in Romans 8.32, since God loved us enough to give us his own son, won't he love us enough to take care of every one of our other needs? That's what Paul says in Romans 8 and 2. Matthew says it a different way in his gospel in the sixth chapter. Matthew says, uh, if God takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, don't you know that he would take care of you? Because you mean more to God than birds and flowers. Why do you mean more to God than birds and flowers? Because he spoke them into existence. But he made you with his own hands. He blew the breath of life in you. And because of that, he would take care of your every need. So you can say you love God, you can sing that you trust God, and that you put him first, but if your wallet or your checkbook does not show that you do that, then you are not, not Christ-like. God wants you to become a generous giver like him. He wants you to make your life count, and, 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 and he wants you to be generous. The third and final thing is this. By sharing the good news of his grace. Acts 20 and 4 says the most important thing is that I complete my mission. The work that the Lord Jesus gave me. To tell people the good news about God's grace. Notice it doesn't say the most important thing in life is to get married fund your retirement, to travel, to have fun, to pay off the mortgage, or become famous. But it says the most important thing in life is to fulfill your mission. Jesus died on the cross for you. Yeah, he died on the cross for you and, and showed his grace to you so that you can fulfill your mission and, but if you fail to fulfill your mission, then you have become a massive external waste. So part of the mission, just part, not all, but part of the mission is to tell other people the good news of grace. God put you on earth for a reason. God put you on earth for a purpose. He has a mission that only you can fulfill. The mission is catered just for you. You are to tell other people about the Lord. Because the fact of the matter is, you haven't always been where you are. You have, all, you have not always been saved. Somebody told you about the Lord. 
somebody witness to you about the Lord. Paul says like this, one planet, one water, but only God can give the increase. So one of the ways we show gratitude for our salvation is to share the good news with other people and to tell them about the wondrous love of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter uh, that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody in his family because everybody needs Jesus because God cares. And because God cares, we must care. I tell you, his grace is just so amazing. His grace is just so amazing. It's so amazing. His love for me, the sacrifice that he made for me, for every blessing given to me, for every valley he used to strengthen me, I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his mercy. But if it were not for his grace, where would I be? I, it's amazing. God's grace is amazing. And I don't know about you, but I stand amazed at his grace. I stand amazed at his glory. I stand amazed at his strength. I, I stand amazed at his power. Every time he blesses me, so amazing. Every time he, he keeps me so amazing. Whenever he stays by my side, so amazing. Food on my, food on my table, so amazing. Clothes on my back, so amazing. Shoes on my feet, so amazing. When he saved my soul, so amazing. When he made me whole, so amazing. God's grace is amazing. I tell you, he's an awesome God. He's an amazing God. He's a powerful God. Uh, he's, he, he's, he's an amazing healer. He's a, an amazing deliverer. He's an amazing way maker. He's a, an amazing provider. Every time, every time he has brought me through He's amazing. Even when I didn't see my way, he's amazing. His grace is amazing. His love is amazing. His mercy is amazing. I declare that his grace is amazing. John Newton. Had it right when he said, with pen and paper in hand, amazing grace. His grace is amazing. And because his grace is amazing, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secure. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endure. His grace is amazing. My brothers and my sisters, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If by chance you do not know about this amazing grace of God, you have not experienced his amazing grace for yourself. Tonight is a good night to get connected up with him. Tonight is a good night to get saved. Tonight is a good night to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. For the Bible declares that if you Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you, yeah, you, you shall be saved. No matter what you have done, no matter what your issues are, no matter, no matter what uh, baggage you may have, 
the Bible declares, you shall be saved. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe in your heart that he did die on Calvary one Friday. Believe in your heart that on the third day he did get up with all power in his hand. Believe in your heart that he is alive and well and sitting on the right-hand side of the Father in heaven making intercession for the saints. Believe that he is coming back again. If you believe that, confess. Confess your sins. Uh, repent of your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I declare that you will be saved. Shall we bow? Shall we pray? Oh God, we confess our gratitude for your grace. We pray, God, that you help us fulfill your mission in our lives. Help us to use our abilities, our talents, and our gifts in ministry to help build your kingdom through our witness. God, we thank you for, in, for, for loving us enough uh, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary Cross for our sins. Now, God, if there's someone tonight who have never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and as your, their Savior, we pray that they will open their hearts and receive him tonight. We pray, God, that they will let him come into their life and save them and then lead them for the rest of their life. God, we thank you for our fellowship tonight. And we pray, God, that you would keep us in your care. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you tonight. Uh, again, we thank you for joining us. We invite you to uh, join us on next Wednesday for uh, Wednesday in the Word uh, at uh, 7 p.m. Of course, uh, you are always invited to join us for our Sunday morning worship experience uh, at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. Uh, please come and celebrate the Lord with us. Until we meet again, continue to be encouraged and stay in His grip. God bless you. Have a blessed week.